Now we decide to wonder if we're regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. And they were all together with Solomon's cohorting them. None of the rest there joined us, but the people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord multitudes of both men and women. So that they even carried out the same to the streets and laid them on casks and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. The people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and we were all healed. So as we said the last time, this uh, particular section of Acts from verse 12 all the way to verse 42 actually reveals the early church's pattern for evangelism, for biblical evangelism. The church was growing so quickly that we have thousands upon thousands, multitudes of people now belonging to the church. And believers were actively evangelizing. So the church started with just 120 people in the first chapter of Acts. By the end of chapter 2, they were 3,000. Uh, around chapter 4, they were 5,000 men only. And then uh, here in chapter 5, we will see that they were clean to grow. And there's no more number, it just says multitudes. And multitudes means thousands more. So there is continuous growth in the early church. And we did say that it's because of five things. Um, purity, which we studied the last time, verses 12 to 14. And then uh, power, which we will look at at this time. The first part of verse 12 and verses 15 to 16. Then, of course, that meant with persecution which we will look at in verses 17 to 28 next Sunday. And hopefully next Sunday also verses 10 from verses 29 to 32. Then finally, it was marked with productivity, and that is from verses 13 to 42. So we looked at purity in the last time, and we said that that was triggered mainly by what um, God did to Ananias and Spira. In verses 1 to 11. And he purifies his church, and today he still does that. Of course, not as dramatically. And hopefully, nobody will fall dead in our church because of church discipline. But church discipline should still be done. And we are required, of course, in Matthew 18 15, that it has to be done practically first. And then we do a three witnesses to establish the truth. Uh, if there is an uh, unrepentant spirit, then it goes all the way to uh, the church so that the church can admonish the one who is in the wrong to repent. Of course, Galatians 6 1 tells us that we were spiritual. Uh, that's the warning to us that before we even attend a church discipline, we have to come under the control of the Holy Spirit. Uh, James 5 encourages us that those who bring a wandering a person back to the faith, uh, that's his best. And of course, uh, particularly for elders and pastors, we have uh, guidelines for doing that in 1 Timothy 5, 17 to 22. So we are responsible actually to discipline our own lives, and that must continue because when the church is pure, um, as we saw in verse 12, they were all together in Solomon's portico. There, there is a unity that results from purity. Of course, uh, you see a statement there in verse 13 it says, None of the rest there joined them. And that seems to suggest to you that uh, um, how are they getting any growth if none of the rest? Uh, there join them. It's crucial, I think, to see the word rest. None of the rest. The rest are those who are obviously not believers. Those who are outside the purview of the church. Those who have not been born yet. So these are the rest. And they dare not join them. That actually suggests that um, evangelism actually it's not our work, but God's work. It's God who adds to our number and not us in our efforts. Our task, though, 
is to be painful in sharing the gospel and reaching out to others, being friendly, uh, being edifying, you know, being winsome, uh, but then to the point of uh, compromising the gospel message. So when a gospel message is seen by people who are living in purity or actually in unity, then actually it's a disincentive for people to join because people will understand, other people will understand the rest of the world who uh, do not care about our faith will understand. The joining the church requires a uh, significant commitment, a total life commitment. That's what we learned from the first. But you know, even if they dare not join them, the people held them in high esteem, which tells you that the lives that these people were living were worthy of the esteem of others, meaning that they were living upright lives. And this is probably the result of us disciplining ourselves. And that must happen also in our church. And because they were held in high esteem, not because, but maybe um, in that environment where people in the church were held in high esteem, more than ever believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. Notice the text says that more than ever believers were added to the church. No. It says believers were added to the Lord, the Lord's body. The body of Christ is the church. And so believers were being added by the Lord to the body of Christ. How many multitudes of both men and women? Multitudes means that they have not passed the number 10,000 because Hebrews would only only have uh, their arithmetic only goes up to 10,000. So we have 10,000 in them. And only believers were being added to the church. Uh, God does not add the non believer to the church. God only adds true believers to the church. So here we see the purity of the church in probably its best view. And was there this purity of activism will be there also? Why? Not because we are nice people, not because we are worthy of esteem, but because God will add to a church that is obedient to Him. See? God will not add people to a false church. God will not add uh, people to a church that is um, uh, not preaching His Word. So in that the question why are there so many huge mega churches that are pastored by pastors who are not faithful to the word? Well, it is not God who is adding to their number. That is the broad road that is wide and many joining, right? So that is not the narrow gate that few find, but the broad road that many join. So, numbers don't necessarily mean that the church is being blessed by the Lord um, with more and more people. Now, there will be growth in the church that is pure. That is what, the, what this text tells us. But not because the church is pure, but because God will bring believers to a church that is obedient to Him. Now, for those other churches that seem to be really big and the numbers seem to be growing week by week, month by month, uh, they practice all of these attractional practices. They, they, you know, they they try to be entertaining. You know? Um, or uh, they try to attract people because of, you know, false signs and wonders. We'll deal with that uh, today. Then, um, that is not God adding to his body. So let's just be discerning about those things. A church that is uh, small in number, but pure in character, 
we will take to be blessed by the Lord with people that He will have in the church. Maybe not in big numbers. The church doesn't always have to be big. Now, our church, of course, is blessed with numbers. We are a big church, not by any standard. Um, and our hope is to stay faithful to the purity of the gospel preaching so that our church will continue to receive those that the Lord is having. And we do not want to ask people ourselves. Now, we want to be friendly and open to others, but we do not want to black people just because we're nice or because we're friendly. We have to be nice. But don't get me wrong. We have to be friendly. And that's what we do every Wednesday when we do the Ortega's Community Outreach. Uh, we try to be nice to the pastors bar. We offer them donuts and coffee. And if they take up on our offer, of course, we bring them in and we, we try to befriend them. And then we share the gospel with them. And many of them pray receive Christ, although we don't know whether it's real or not, and so the proof of that is if they stay. And many of them have stayed and have come back. Yeah, we've already formed at least, we've already done at least one out of those series. Um, Wednesday night, we're now on our second. Uh, we're also contemplating more evangelism training so we can increase our volunteers. So, you know, we have a need to be here. A church that to be here, the, the Lord will add to their number. So that's what we learned last time. What we learned today is that aside from purity, the church that evangelizes will do so with power. And this needs a little bit of explaining, you know, because uh, you might ask me later, why don't we have supernatural acts? in this church. I know about you, but I see something supernatural that happens every week, every day. Uh, we see lives change. Is that supernatural? Anyway, a pure church will always have power. And the church in Jerusalem then had it. The Sanhedrin had threatened the apostles against any public ministry. Remember in chapter 4, verse 18, they called them and charged them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. A very clear blanket that for them. They are not to preach in Jesus' name. They are not to share the gospel. Of course, Peter and John answered them and said, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather than to God, you must judge. In other words, that's a backhanded uh, way of saying, we're not going to listen to you, we're going to listen to God. And God tells us to share the, the gospel in the name of Jesus. And they continue to do that. But it's impossible to hide the power of your church. And we see that here. So they were born. That's why verse 12 actually starts with now many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. It's important to note that the Book of Acts is a historical book. It records what happened in history. Not everything that is recorded in the Book of Acts should be treated as normative or normal for the Christian life. Such that the things that are recorded in history necessarily have to repeat themselves today. That's an important hermeneutical tool or a tool for interpretation. In the Gospels, the Gospels and the Book of Acts are all historical books. And the historical books contain certain supernatural activities that do not necessarily have to happen today. There are many churches who teach that the Book of Acts is still open and that many of the signs and wonders should still be happening today. I'm not saying that I want to put that in the box and limit his, his prerogative. If he wants signs and wonders to happen today, he can. But we believe that he doesn't anymore. And there's a reason for that. But during that time, many signs and wonders were regularly done. They were done daily. Um, and there was a purpose for that. Uh, signs and 
kilometers here on this day is the term that's used for miraculous healing and supernatural casting out of demonic uh, possession uh, among people during the time. There was a lot of that during the time. The devil was very active. And the apostles were regularly doing miracles. So you would see them uh, perform healings. Uh, they would preach in other languages so that other people could interpret or understand what they were saying. And they would interpret. So the tongues were not gibberish or just blabbering. They were genuine human languages. These were what we call the sign gifts. They are gifts that were given as a sign. As a sign of what? That what the apostles were proclaiming was the word of God. Remember, remember the time when Jesus came and then um, Nicodemus came to see him, right? It's in John chapter 3. And in John 3 verse 2, Nicodemus actually said to Jesus, we know that you are a man who has come from God because of the signs, the works that you are doing. He was referring to the miracles. So the miracles in the during the time was viewed by people as a sign that what was being shared to them was from God. Nicodemus understood that. The Sanhedrin actually understood that. Nicodemus eventually came to faith, together with Joseph of Arimathea. So the witness of Jesus in the Sanhedrin did not go to waste. There were at least two out of the 71 who came to faith. And I would argue later on when we go to um, um, the next part of this lesson next week, you will find another man named Gamaliel, who might have been also converted to this part of the Sanhedrin. So anyway, yeah, that's just my opinion, but I'll get to that when we get to that portion. In biblical history, the periods of time where there was a significant spike of supernatural activities were number one in the beginning of time. So from Genesis chapter 1 to 11, you will see a lot of supernatural intervention of the Lord, of the of our the, of God uh, into the earth. He created the world and the universe in six days, six literal 24 hour days. Yes, I believe that. I do not believe in evolution. I do not believe in theistic evolution, which says that, well, evolution really happened when God started it. No, that's not good enough for me because Genesis is a historical book. And Hebrew scholars tell us that the structure of the language in Genesis 1 is a historical record. Therefore, I will not like rise it. I will not add symbols to it. If it says that in the first day and the and the and the day and the night, that was the first day, that's a 24 hour day. Right? That's what I believe. Can God create everything in six days? He can create everything in one day if he wants to. That he created it in six days. I don't know why. Maybe he wanted to set the, the time frame for a week so that we count our days by weeks, right? Maybe that's the reason. But he could have created everything in an instant. The reason why people believe in evolution is because people think that um, the supernatural is not real, cannot happen. And so it had to happen, happened over gazillions of years. And starting with the Big Bang, then the universe it, you know, exploding up and creating stars and working planets. God said, let there be light, and there was light. Can he do that in one day? He can do that in one second. He's God. If we believe in the supernatural, then we should believe in the creation of God. 
is a historical example. It is not a myth. Evolution is the myth. It takes more faith to believe that nothing times nobody equals everything. That's what evolution teaches. Evolution teaches that nothing times nobody equals everything. Now, for me, it is hard to believe that in the beginning, God created the heavens. The reason why evolutionists don't want to acknowledge God because they don't want to be accountable to him. No? Darby himself admitted that, that he did not want to be accountable to a fearful God. That's why, that's the motive behind the theory of evolution. So the first period is during the beginning, Genesis chapter 1 to 11, you know? Uh, you will see there the creation, you will see there the flood. You know? um, the flood actually is a global flood, it changed uh, the, the whole geography of the world, created a continent perhaps. Um, there's a theory of a what they call a Pangea, which means that the world was, was all connected at one time, and then there was an event that separated all of the continents. Never in the creation of how God created land and put it on one side, and he created the waters and he put it on the other side. Maybe that there was this one big land bus. And the flood probably separated the Atlantis. So that's Genesis 1 to 11. Why was it important for God to supernaturally do that? He did that because the one who recorded the Genesis account will have to come and write that down. So we go to the time of Moses and Joshua. That's the, uh, the second time when there was a lack of supernatural ability. Why? Because God had to authenticate Moses as the writer of the first five books of the Bible. So whenever there is a need for God to authenticate his revelation to man, he performs supernatural ability. Not always, but generally. So you see during the time of Moses, of course, you see, you saw a burning bush that was the first supernatural activity that he encountered. Of course, in chapter 4, verse 3 of Exodus, he had a staff that became a serpent, another supernatural activity. When, of course, he later on got home to Egypt, he turned the water of the Nile into blood, that's chapter 7, verse 20 of Exodus. In chapter 8, verse 10, uh, he turned, uh, he, he caused frogs to come out of the Nile. The zillions of frogs. And then in chapter 8, verse 16, uh, he had the third plague, and that's uh, uh, the gnats, insects, that were that came out of the dust, right? So this was all to just show Pharaoh that what Moses was saying was from God. God was manifesting himself. Uh, then there was a swarm of flies uh, in chapter 8, verse 24. In chapter 9, verse 6 of Exodus, uh, the livestock of all the Egyptians died. No? That's a precursor to what he did later on in chapter 9, verse 10 to 11. Um, he, everybody broke out in boils, big son. There was an epidemic of boils. Um, supernatural activity. Chapter 10, verse 23 to 24, he rained down hail and fire from heaven. So this is all in Exodus. Um, then he sent locusts, the locust story, in chapter 10, verses 13 to 14. In chapter 10, verses 22 to 23, he caused darkness all over the land of Israel. And of course, the greatest of all the plagues is in chapter 12, the death of the firstborn. Chapter 12, verse 29, says at midnight, the Lord struck down all the firstborn 
in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in the dungeon, and all the firstborn of the livestock. So that place happened during Moses' time. That established Moses as the man of God. Of course, the great miracle of the parting of the Red Sea is recorded in Exodus 14, verses 21 to 29. He opened up the Red Sea and he sort of passed through the Red Sea and dry land. Then he caused the Red Sea to collapse from the, from the chasing hordes uh, of the armies of Pharaoh. Then, of course, we're going through the book of Joshua now, and we've already encountered a number of supernatural activity in Joshua. In Joshua 3, of course, we saw the crossing of the river Jordan, just like the Red Sea crossing. They crossed on dry land. Two million people crossing the river Jordan all in one day on dry land. That's supernatural. In chapter 6, of course, we saw the collapsing of the wall of Jericho, just by people shouting. And they were having a praise and worship session going around the walls of the city, and the city walls collapsed. Uh, of course, we already know from chapter 10 that he made the sun to stand still and the moon, so that the day was extended from the usual 12 hour morning to the 24 hour morning to probably have been longer. And we have records of a long day or a long night all over the world, historical records. So it's not an isolated event. So all of this happened during the time of Moses and Joshua. Why? Because Moses wrote the first five books. And Joshua wrote Joshua. It authenticated the revelation of God given through them. And they were considered prophets. So that all the prophets now that came after them were thereby also authenticated. But there was another spike of supernatural authority. It was during the lifetime of the prophets Elijah and Elisha. In 1 Kings 18, uh, Elijah did battle against 400 of the uh, priests. And, you know, they, they cried out for a fire to come down from, from heaven, and nothing happened. And, of course, we know the story Elijah whispered a prayer. A, an offering that was flooded with water was consumed by fire in seconds after he prayed. He prayed that there might be no rain and there was no rain. When he prayed for the rain to come, the rain came after three years. So we see that in the life of Elijah. Uh, of course, he was carried well, he was carried to heaven by chariots of fire. I probably watched that movie before, maybe you're too young to remember the movie Chariots of Fire. That's where they got the title. Because Elijah was taken up to heaven. This is the second occurrence of a rapture in the Bible. The second occurrence. Do you remember the first? Enoch, Genesis 5. That was the first rapture. The second one is Elijah. He did not die. I actually think that Moses was also raptured. So nobody ever saw Moses die. They just have this account that Moses died on Mount Nebo and God buried him there. Why would God bury anyone if he could just take them home? That's my test of me. So, uh, there's a debate about that, and I think Moses also was raptured. Why? Because Moses and Elijah appeared in glory with Jesus in the Mount of Transfiguration. That's just my theory of okay? it, that's not uh, invaluable truth. Elijah himself performed a lot of miracles, like the oil with the uh, woman, the widow from Zarephath. And the Shunammite woman and her son, uh, where Elisha actually caused the son uh, to be to have a land after he died. And there was another episode with um, a Gentile king, Naaman, 
friends who he told to just take him to join them several times and he was cured of his leprosy. So all of this happened during the time of Elijah and Elisha. They were prophets. And whatever prophecies they proclaimed were recorded in scripture and authenticated by the supernatural. So you see the pattern in scripture is that the supernatural activities normally spy in order to authenticate the writers of scripture when needed. Later on, there's a succession of prophets. Um, once the reputation of prophets was established by Samuel, by Elijah, by Elisha, then came Daniel and Hosea and, and Isaiah and Ezekiel. The reputation of prophets as spokespersons from God was established, and from time to time they would be enabled to do supernatural activity to authenticate their message. That's the point. So, during the time of Christ's ministry on the earth, there was a spike of supernatural activity. Why? God was on the earth. So there was a spike of supernatural activity. I will go through some of that. And of course, the time of the apostles. And here in the book of Acts, we will study a number of the supernatural things that they've done. We already studied more in Acts chapter 3, but Peter and John healed uh, later, here in Matthew. So, all of these were being done to a pure church in order to authenticate the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. So, this seems to be the pattern. There were times when there was a lot of revelation coming from God to man. Together with that revelation came a lot of um, authenticating signs. Once the revelation had been set and sent, the sign would normally stop. A lot of people think that there was like miracles happening every day uh, in the book of Acts. That only happens really in the first part of the book of Acts. Uh, later on, um, Paul became sick and he could not feed himself. He told Timothy to take some wine for his stomach instead of healing him supernaturally. So by that time, um, in the book of Acts, miracles have already stopped. Because the, the, the readers of the gospel revelation were already authenticated. And that's the reason why we were behind signs and wonders. After seeing the miracles that the apostles did in the name of Jesus Christ, the people were open to hearing him. In fact, Paul said that in 2 Corinthians 12, 12, the signs of a true apostle were performed among you with what? With utmost patience, with signs and wonders and mighty works. That was the sign that authenticated the true apostle. Many, there were many faith apostles even during that time, even during the day, who have counterfeit signs and wonders. But they're not real. The healings that happened then were instantaneous, immediate, not gradual, and impossible to deny. You remember when Peter and John were tried in front of the second wave? Exhibit A, the main maker, was right beside them. Throughout the shrine, so that the Sanhedrin could not deny that a miracle happened to that shrine in the name of Jesus Christ. Jesus himself, um, the Hebrews chapter 2, verse 4, uh, says this which God also bore witness by signs and wonders and various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to His will. And this is the revelation that was given to the apostles. They were authenticated by signs and wonders. Jesus Himself, of course, during His life on earth, as you mentioned earlier, there was a spike of supernatural activity. He went into a town, He performed miracles, and then He told the people who, who He was. In John chapter 2, he turned water into wine. Although he did not publicly reveal himself, but his disciples believed in him because of what he did. In John chapter 
3, verse 2, Nicodemus acknowledged. And he said, This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with you. So these signs by John chapter 3, Nicodemus and the Sanhedrin had already known that he was doing all of these wondrous signs. Of course, John just recorded the sign of the burning of the water into life in the wedding of God. In John chapter 4, he healed the, the, the child of an officer by just saying, okay, your child is healed. And when that man came, he knew that the heart was from Jesus and said, your son will be And he himself believed in all his household. So that was another sign. In John chapter 5, he healed um, a man who was in an invalid for 38 years. He saw him lying there, he knew that he had already been there a long time. He said, Do you want to be healed? The same man answered him, Are you kidding? Of course I want to be healed. No? Sir, I have no one to put me to the pool. So Jesus said to him, Get up, take up your bed, and walk. He didn't need to go to the pool. There was a superstition about the pool in Bethesda. But Jesus was the leader, so he knew it. John chapter 6, he. Uh, that's actually the feeling of the 20,000 if you ask me. 5,000 is just the man. In John chapter 6, verse 19, he walked on water when his disciples were in the boat. And there was a storm in the middle of the sea of God. He not just walked on one water. After he got into the boat, he said immediately the boat was at the land to which they were going. So they're in the middle of the sea. He walked on water and then on the boat, and then boom, he needs to think the word, so that's actually a second miracle. In John chapter 7, verse 31, it says, Many people believed in him, he said, When the Christ appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? You see, he was authenticated by the works that he was done. In John chapter 9, he made a blind man see, a man born blind. In John 11, of course, he did his greatest miracle. He called out Lazarus from the grave after being in the grave for four days. Of course, the greatest miracle was when he rose from the grave himself. So when he, when Jesus was here, he practically banished all disease in Israel during the time his time on earth, and he did so to benefit the people who had the real need. There was a, a lack of disease and a lack of demonic oppression in the land of Israel during the time that they were really waiting for the Messiah to come, and he did come. So we saw that in Luke 4, when we were, we were going to read the book of Luke, we will go to Luke 6 at the day. And in Luke 4, you remember, he, he, uh, he freed a man of an unclean spirit in Capernaum, in the synagogue, while he was teaching on the Sabbath day. In Luke 4, in verse 40, he healed all those who had any who were sick with virus diseases, brought them to him, and he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them all. The demons called for him out of many, crying, You are the Son of God, but he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak because they knew that he was the Christ. In Luke 4, 42, he said that all of this was happening because I must preach the good news of the gospel of God to the other towns as well, for I was sent for this purpose. So all of the supernatural activity was to precede his preaching. And that the apostles also to follow the same pattern. Peter preached on the day of Pentecost after all the supernatural activity. You know, the flames, the sign of the towns. No, when they spoke in different human languages, uh, the wind, the sound of the wind, where they were. Uh, and then after all of that supernatural activity, he preached his, his sermon of the day of Pentecost. And then he came to faith. How many? 3,000. That's a good harvest for the first day of the church. The fourth day of Peter and John gave the land better here in chapter 3 of Acts. And they, they just told him to, to rise up in the name of Jesus. And he, he rose up, and he walked, and he jumped, and he ran, and 
and he was a civil king in front of the sand people. They were giving him a preach to the sand people. So after the supernatural activity came the priest, and that was the pattern in the book of Acts, at least in the early time. So it says in verses 15 to 16, so that they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and nuts, that the speaker came, came by, at least a shadow might fall on some of them. Now it does not say people were healed by Peter's shadow. It just says that the people were trying to get themselves healed by casting themselves under Peter's shadow. Because there was a belief during the time that the shadow of a man of God, a man of God can heal people. It doesn't really say that people got healed. But it does say that the people also gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits, and they were all healed. They were all healed. So there was a lot of healing going on, according to this verse in chapter 2. So the streets of Jerusalem were probably an incredible sight. Everywhere there were beds occupied by rich and poor alike. They were all waiting for the apostles to move through the town. The inhabitants of Jerusalem have to believe that Peter's shadow would heal, because some ancient people believe that the man's shadow carried his influence. So parents, for example, would place their children into the shadow of a great man and snatch them away from the shadow of someone they did not like. So then the whole time. The text doesn't say that Peter's shadow healed anyone. But you know, these actions show that they have a tremendous respect for Peter. That was a perfect platform for him to say. I hear you in the name of Jesus. He's the one that we preach. He's the one you should believe. And many came to faith. And that's why there were multitudes of men and women who were being brought into the church. The early church was a powerful church. The church today can be also if we are pure. Now, will all of these miracles happen again today? I, I don't think so. If God wants to, we can. Um, I believe that there might be no need because we do have the Bible already. We do have the testimony of the prophets in the Old Testament and the apostles in the New Testament. They were eyewitnesses, they were all historical records, and the epistles explain what happened in history. From Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts, the epistles explain that the force revelation tells us what will happen in the future. So we have a complete Bible, and that is not what we proclaim. We're not proclaiming anything new. So please don't expect me to perform miracles. If I could perform miracles, I would heal my back. And heal my kidneys, and heal my heart, and take away my diabetes. I will be slim with a 32 inch waist instead of a 42 inch waist. So, if I could perform miracles, I will do it first on myself. But I can. But the greatest miracle has already happened to me, and that's my salvation. That's your salvation. You are not supposed to be saved. We are all on this of wrath, the beasts who tell us. Sons of disobedience. We're all dead in our transgressions and sins. But God, because of His great love and mercy, made us one, alive in Christ, and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms. That's a miracle. And I see that happening every Wednesday after all. I see people come to faith in Christ. I'm not sure I can see their eyes, but I see people hearing the gospel and responding positively. That's a good sign. And we have people now to follow. And there are many, many people in our church, many of our elders and us pastors, who all came from being rebels of the cross, but now we are soldiers of the cross. That's a miracle. 
you know, sometimes hear of the conversion of Paul and say, that's a miracle. But that happened to you. That happened to me. We were all persecutors of Christ because we disobeyed him. But now we are believers. That's a miracle. The Bible says you cannot say Jesus is Lord unless the Holy Spirit enables you. You cannot say it and mean it. But we all do it. That's a That's power. That's present day Holy Spirit power in a church. And that is what we do. I end with 2 Timothy 2 19 to 21. It says, But God's firm foundation stands very busy. The Lord knows those who are His. You know why? Because He chose us from before the foundation of the world. So He knows those who are His. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. You see in that verse, our responsibility and God's sovereignty. See? God knows who are who is his. That's his sovereignty. That he chose us from before the foundation of the world. But it says that everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from me. That's our responsibility. It's in one verse. How can it happen, Pastor? I don't know. But both are true. We are responsible for our actions. God is sovereign over our salvation. Don't ask me to explain. Then it says, Now in the great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. You know, we are saved by grace through faith so that we can do good works that the Lord has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. That's what we were praying that for. And we are all miracles, supernatural change agents. And the power of the supernatural spirit inhabits us. So, let us allow the Master to make us useful by keeping ourselves pure, departing from the middle. Because we have been chosen. Ephesians 1 4 says, We were chosen, predestined to be holy and blameless. To be holy and blameless. So we want to be pure so that we can have power. That's our destiny. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this message that you have given us from your word. May we carry this in our hearts and obey in our lives. May you find us pure before you, not sinless, but always dealing with the sin that we have in our hearts and minds and in our bodies. Always coming to you with an attitude of confession and repentance. And we pray, Father, that as you purify us, you might use us with power to share the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation. And just by yielding the gospel, Father, we know that we will be agents of supernatural change in the lives of others. May that happen to each one of us. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen.